Well, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to join you um, uh, as your honorary president. It's a, it's a really good excuse for coming. I like to be able to join you. And I come because I really am uh, in, fundamentally interested in the rural economy. You give me the opportunity to do that. And I come to a place where you probably get the best informed debate and some of the most inspiring speakers. So it's all, it is a real pleasure to join you. And I hope you all feel, and I'm guessing that your presence uh, here today and the numbers of you who come also appreciate that opportunity, the range of speakers, the range of topics to be debated uh, are, are what attracts you. Uh, and you're not entirely weather dependent on whether you turn up or not. Um, although in this particular stage of the winter, that's, this is probably a good place to be. We know that these conditions, of course, help farmers deal uh, with adversity, with a degree of resilience, which perhaps some others um, don't have to deal with on a such a permanent basis. But it also engenders a considerable amount of pioneering, and uh, as that spirit of pion that ability to pioneer still exists, and to adapt to changing circumstances. And that's really what you've been debating um, today and will be tomorrow the way that things change, but the things that need to remain the same, the knowledge base that needs to remain the same so that you can change the way you do things. I think our, in, uh, our three speakers in your rural economy uh, speakers in their very different ways have touched on all of those uh, today. I, I have to say that I have uh, some sympathy with uh, uh, the issues of health and safety, and uh, the way in which your speaker apparently had completely disregard for health and safety in his own terms, but has now learnt how to do it in, in other aspects. It's not anybody who rides horses, frankly, throws the health and safety booklet away <laughs> every time you get on. Um, and although I have a suspicion that he may have already booked um, Duncan's um, lag an adventure opportunity just to see what the trip was. No? Okay. <laughs> so, I thought bawling was right up your street, but that was it. And to Duncan, I would just say that if nobody has actually said anything about the toilets, that's a great success. <laughs> uh, we know some, some of the things remain uh, fundamentally basic, and that's one of them. But it's also, uh, I think, uh, to hear Carla uh, talking very much at the front line of a big agribusiness uh, must be a huge encouragement uh, to those, those women who I suspect have always been part of the farming sector, the economy sector in the UK, don't often have a public profile in that role. And I hope that will be an enormous encouragement to them. There is a slight, uh, I suppose it's an encouragement to know that some things are common around the world. Um, so to do that in Brazil, um, it could be done in Scotland as well. Uh, to get that uh, acceptance of women running um, agricultural businesses very much in the front line. But the changes are for you. Uh, they are for you to look at the options, to hear the options, and to learn from each other from best practice. And that's what you get here. It's that the experience of other farmers, they're, farmers who've learnt some of those lessons, who've made successes, that they are the ones that you can recognise, whether that suits your particular operation, your particular structure, or maybe your particular family. And that issue about succession is not the first time we've heard about it, and I hope it won't be the last, because that is an issue that is constantly needs to be revisited to make sure that that continuity in decision-making and land use uh, remains active. And I've, we all underestimate the importance of that particular debate, so thank you for bringing that up. But we also need to understand that our education system uh, also needs to remember the basics uh, that are necessary to our ability to remain healthy is based on the food we eat and how we produce it. And those basic facts remain the same. 
we need to move, we need to change, remembering those real basics, whether that's because we recognize that mixed farming perhaps is, is, gives us those basics, or how intensification can be managed to produce the, what we know we need in the right way. And that's uh, from Professor Elliot uh, reminding us of the, the dangers that face the farming sector. And I, I come across a lot of really good businesses in the countryside. I have the opportunity to see what they do on a local basis and how much those businesses rely on a good brand, on the trust of the local people, trust what they produce. And if you lose that trust, how much that costs the entire sector. You mentioned about organic farming. That is certainly true. But in any other kind of farming, that undermines everything you're trying to achieve. So there is a real need for people to understand where those weak spots are in terms of fraud, food safety, authenticity, and understanding nutritional values. I would uh, argue that on education is finding it difficult, I think, to fit this into uh, the program and their curriculum at the moment. And I, I, with my role in the British Nutrition Foundation, uh, we give awards for those schools who produce very good results, both GC GCSE and A-levels. I was slightly appalled to discover that in the English schools, they're giving up the A-level uh, on nutrition and science. We were all, well, staggered, frankly, that in this day and age, where you mention not only lack of food, but too much food, how you can possibly argue that you don't need that level of education in nutritional science available for young people. Not only is it a, is it a science and a proper science in its own right, but it is about encouraging the schools and the young people to maintain an interest in their food and what they're eating from the very earliest age right the way on through their school careers. Our education system really does need, I think, to respond in the same way. It needs to understand much more about the issues that you've been talking about, to realize what the challenges are for young people uh, in assessing the food that they eat and for their parents too. We fundamentally fund where the basic uh, ingredients are produced to the best possible uh, standards, and that's what we would like to do. We need to find a way of ensuring that that's true, that they get to the people who need, need it, and that they understand what they're getting. That's quite a, a long chain, but all of you, what you've heard today, is part of that debate. And I hope you will find the confidence to go away from today and be able to understand better how you fit into that process and why it's so important to understand all of those parts of the process. Because it is the integrity which is going to make your businesses, whether it's directly related to food or the rural economy and the services you provide through it, it is that integrity that will make your businesses successful. So I hope you've had a, a, an informative and although I, your last speaker did say it was slightly gloomy, in encouraging uh, day in terms of uh, opportunities and what change can mean and how it can be done. But it is about sharing that knowledge and information that you can gain here at the Oxford Farming Conference that I think will make the difference. Uh, your new venue tomorrow at the Sheldonian Theatre, I'm sure, will add to that value. And I'm sure that tonight's... Um, comedy night um, hosted by Scottish farmer Jim Smith will be a continuation of what we've already heard today, but end up with a smile on your faces uh, because that is quite important. But it is a pleasure to join you and I, we all owe a debt of thanks to your committee and those who put together this conference every year through their own passion and interest and commitment to the farming and the rural economy sector. So thank you all very much indeed.